Good evening, ladies. I want to welcome you to our third Thursday. Um, I want to introduce to you Pamela Benham, and she is a wonderful, wonderful artist and painter um, who has been exhibiting for many, many years. Um, she studied painting in New York City at the Art Students League under Ford Foundation grant and a Reginald Marsh scholarship. And she graduated from the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art with a BFA. And then she moved to Paris where she studied at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts for two years. Influential teachers were Robert Beverly Hale, Dory Ashton, Paul Rasika, Leland Bell, Stefan Posen and Pierre Caron. And she is a, a recipient of the Artist Space Grant and an um, Adolf Gottlieb Foundation Grant. Wow. She was also award, uh, awarded Artist in Residence at the Scohegan School in Maine, Cité Internationale des Arts in Paris, per, uh, Parsons Altos de Chavon. I'm, I'm sure I'm butchering this, I'm sorry, in the Dominican Republic and the Colgate University in Hamilton, New York. She has exhibited internationally in museums and galleries, including the Musée d'Art Moderne in, and the Musée de Luxembourg in Paris. She has over 20 solo exhibition galleries in New York, including the Miller, Susan Schreiber, uh, Jane Baum Gallery, and the two, in the last two years, Benham's 30 exhibitions include Monmouth Museum in New Jersey, Attleboro Arts Museum in Massachusetts, and the Rochester Contemporary Art Center in New York. She has now established her West Coast painting studio and uh, the Art House Studio in Santa Barbara, California. And I am so delighted to invite her to talk about her work and such an impressive resume, Pamela. Yeah, Take it away. You. Um, please reserve your questions and comments to the end. Thank you. Thank you for coming to listen and, and for your interest in the work. It's, uh, you know, you, you sort of do, do, do the work alone and you know that you're fascinated by it, but it's always great to have somebody else that's also interested. So thank you all. When I, when I was growing up, you know, the, I'd go to museums and and art galleries, and I'd always be drawn to works that had emotional content. It's what uh, what I noticed, what engaged me. And then I, as an art student, I moved to, you know, how is this created? What did the artist do to evoke this feeling in me? Um, I grew up in a family that um, was very, very limited in the range of emotions that were allowed. So painting gave me the ability to, to expand, to be more than, than I was allowed to be and to know more. And it, and it still does. Um, often an artist's career is thought to be linear, you know, uh, moving from this place to this style to this, uh, mine is much more like a pendulum. It swung back and forth uh, from representational work to uh, distorted, exaggerated color, expressive representational work and abstract work, and then back again. Uh, my parents were against me studying art. Uh, I, they wanted me to be a secretary or a, a grammar school teacher. I knew I wanted to paint and I knew I wanted to study art, so I didn't take their money. And so I, I worked as a waitress. I put myself through school as a waitress, waitressing um, two nights a week and living minimally. In, uh, at Cooper Union, I, I studied mainly with Paul Resica. He was a landscape impressionist landscape painter. And I, I learned from him. And then also I, I was up uh, at Skowhegan was a summer school where they brought people from all over the United States to study there for the summer. And that's where I met uh, Janet Fish and Klaus Olenberg. 
Um, a teacher of mine, Stefano Cusimano, said, I was painting abstractly when I first entered uh, uh, Cooper Union. And he said, you know, you know more about color than I ever will. Why don't you learn how to draw and paint representationally? So I thought, oh, sounds wise. So I, so I think I will. Um, what I, at the same time, I was reading Leonardo da Vinci's notebooks, and he suggested the way to learn to draw and paint is to do copies. So this copy is a, a loose copy of um, Rape of the Sabine Women by Poussin, and I did it at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I got accepted into the Ecole de Beaux-Arts and um, when I was studying with uh, Pierre Caron and his emphasis, what he really paid attention to was edges, you know, soft edges versus hard edges and overlap. What is on top of what? So my impressionism started tightening up a bit. I ended up having, you know, more sharp edges, more defined shapes and forms. Uh, when I was at Skowhegan, Klaus Ollenberg did a critique and he said, you know, there's lots of, of, of methods that you can paint, lots of styles you can use at this point, but whatever you do, don't paint impressionistically. It's like, ah, you know, that was, that was my style, but I didn't, I didn't give it up right away. I kept, I kept going for a while. This was another copy I copied in the Louvre. I continued my copying. And this one was, um, I was doing a Delacroix Odalesque and this fellow came up to me and said, uh, will you do a copy for me? And I didn't want to just copy anything. I wanted it to be something, it takes a long while. So I wanted it to be something I'd be interested in, I'd learn from. So I gave him a choice of five paintings and he chose this one. It's a Claude Vernet and a Marine. And it was a way of earning money. And the other way I, the other ways I supported myself was I did charcoal portraits of tourists in front of the Louvre. I played my guitar in the Metro uh, and I taught uh, conversational French to businessmen, French businessmen. In Paris, my friends would come over and I would do uh, I'd paint their portraits. Um, this was the first painting I had, the first group of paintings I did in acrylic. And I was trying to make them uh, work like oils uh, you know, often people talk a lot about the technique. I also want to talk about my own sense of what's going on with the painting, because I find that interesting when the artist actually talks about the work. So um, for me, this guy, you know, sort of what, what emotions going on with him? He's, uh, he's looking a little skeptical, maybe, uh, you know, a little apprehensive with drawing. So you have the, the expression that's in the facial expression, but also the body language and also then the color and how it's painted. This is another portrait I did in, uh, in my studio. Um, my studio was my bedroom. It was just a 12 by 12 foot bedroom that was also my studio <laughs> in Paris. Um, this, I, I really like the, the multiplicity, the, the duality, the, not more than duality, the, the numbers of, of feelings that, that this face can shift to. Um, and, and so much of it depends, I feel, on the, on the observer and what, what state they're in when they're looking at it. You know, as there's a certain degree of projection of what's going on with them, but also even just their own sensitivities and sensibilities read different feelings into the work. And as far as I'm concerned, what they see is just as important as what I see. This is a self-portrait when I had darker hair. <laughs> this is, um, I, I got really involved with the idea of pushing objects and figures in front of the picture plane. You know, put it into the viewer space. Um, and I was living near Rue de Seine and there was this great uh, fruit and vegetable market. So these, these leeks uh, have been called by friends of mine, uh, leeks in bondage. <laughs> and this is um, a bouquet of radishes. This is not a collage, it's painted uh, trompe l'oeil. 
Um, I'm not really sure exactly how to describe what I think is going on here, but, uh, you know, it's sort of um, woman and strawberry is sensual attraction, uh, but also our own sense of ourselves sensually and sexually. And I, I feel that if it, if it swings to that being too dominant, then there's a sense, there's a kind of a split between the, the heart and the crotch. This piece is three feet by seven feet. And again, the figure is life-size and she's coming in front of the, the picture frame. Uh, having this frame as uh, portrayed, I, I stole from Andrea del Sarto in his um, pictures of the apostles in the Uffizi. Um, but I, I did this woman, I wanted to her to be strong and the sense she doesn't have clothes on is is more about not needing, you know, being unprotected, being open to the world, being ready and expansive to to be in the world. Uh, this guy is three feet by six feet. He's life size, and this uh, for me is is kind of about dualism that you have he's certainly being driven by his sexual his sexual drive but he's also restrained he's restraining himself he's holding on to that frame he's like caught in the moment of do i move forward or do i i i not move forward and 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 you know joseph campbell talks about the idea of sometimes things are um two organs in conflict and and the brain is one of those organs. Um, I I like that sort of push pull that can happen. Plus, then you could also flip if you don't identify with him and what's going on with him. You could also then experience, you know, what is this? You know, is it frightening? Is it uh, attractive? What, what what is my feelings toward this? And what, one of the funny things was it was it was hung in the in the Musée de Luxembourg, and people would like start looking at it and they'd get to it and then they'd really quickly walk by it and then they'd look back at it. It's like no one would wanted to stand in front of it. It was like too much. Um, when I showed that painting to a, a gallery director who was, had a wonderful de Kooning show, he said, do 10 of those and I'll give you a show. Well, that painting took nine months to do. And the last thing I was gonna do was 10, you know, nine months, times nine months. Plus at the end of the nine months, I felt I felt like I was ready to give up art. It was, it was so un, unlike my personality to be that precise, that patient, that dealing with the fear of, you know, any minute you could wreck the whole thing. Uh, and it, it felt like a really, really, really tight shoe that was not a good fit with my personality. So when I got back to New York, this piece is uh, eight feet by 10 feet. And it was um, done from the study that you can see a little small study here. It's only one foot tall. Um, that's the study of a rose petal that I did in Paris. And I blew it up and what freedom. I mean, it was like using the whole body movement and gesture and, and I, it just felt like such a release and a relief. Um, so, uh, and also when, when this is in person, it has a, a real, Certainly, the sky, the size creates a scale and the and a presence, but it it really has that sense of presence, which is something I I go for, whether it be large or whether it's created through creating scale in a small painting, but a sense of presence. Now, here's an example of portraits that are using another level of of expression of feeling, which is how the paint is put on and the energy it's put on and what it expresses. So you have this guy who's, you know, his mouth is kind of sad and his eyes look like, what am I doing here? Can I get out? Can I leave now, please? Um, and, then, and then this agitated shirt, you know, this sense of definitely upset. And then this, in, this blue that's just gone, just put, put on with such vigor. And then this single drip, coming down here like a tear. Um, this is me um, 
I'm painting, this is Klaus Ollenberg's Swiss Army Knife boat. Uh, it's in the Guggenheim. You can see the knife here and the corkscrew here. Uh, I was hired to run a, a crew of six artists to do the finish work. And then I was the painter of it. And we brought it into the Guggenheim in pieces. So you can see the joints here where, we, where I plastered it. Uh, not plaster, wall compound actually, uh, together again and I was painting it. Um, in, in New York City, I, my goal was to work two days and have five days to paint. And I was determined to not give up painting. So many of the people got out of school and, did, and gave up painting, whether it be economic, a family, other demands on them, um, but I was not going to give up painting. So I found ways of earning a living that would support my fine art habit. And also I, I did illustration for ad agencies, uh, magazines, uh, quite a lot for Gourmet Magazine uh, and uh, book covers. And then I became a scenic artist and did backdrops and sets for TV commercials. And then also worked for Klaus Hollenberg. He hired me to do this, uh, paint this uh, giant burnt match. I was doing a, a, a rose series. And um, what I like about this rose is it's, it's not your typical rose. It's not this sort of delicate, sensuous, uh, elegant petals uh, that smell extraordinary. It's like an aggressive, strong rose. It's coming out of the darkness and perhaps even scary. Um, whoops. And when I was doing this rose, this rose series, I, I, I started getting more and more abstract. And I thought, you know, can I leave the object? Can I just work from inner feelings from my imagination, is that possible? Um, it was very hard for me to leave the object. I liked being in relationship to it. I liked interpreting it, having a dialogue with it, uh, exaggerating it, uh, all of those things. But one morning I woke up with a dream and on that dream I was like flying up Second Avenue. And I thought, okay, this is it. I'm supposed to fly and give up the anchor of, of the object. So I began painting abstractly. I spent the summer in Vermont. I had I rented a barn and painted in Vermont. New York City was hell at times, uh, very humid. And if you didn't have air conditioning, it was great to get out into the country. Um, these, <clears throat> this is oil, it's 22 by 30. Um, I'm not gonna interpret this one. Uh, this, I, I did about 10, um, four feet by six foot oil on canvas, buckets of turpentine. I wore a mask with double cartridges. And uh, for me, this is about exuberance. It's, it's energy flying up. So much is about, about my work is about different energies and different sounds and, and different uh, forces and uh, but I, this, in this one, I, I just, I, I, I know you're not supposed to say you love your paintings, but I love, I love this sort of veils of silk of color, you know, just, uh, oh. okay, so the pendulum um, swung the other way, and I went back to realism, and I wanted to find a a theme that would hold my interest, because realism takes longer to do, and I tend to always be looking for what's next. Um, so I grew up with a swimming pool. I spent hours in it and loved being in the water. And I also loved going under the water and watching people from under there. It was a great way. They, were un they, they weren't self-conscious and they didn't know I was doing it. And I could just watch them. It was fabulous. So this one I feel has a real quiet. You know, if, he, if you think he's in water, you know, is he drowning? He's not struggling. Uh, he seems more like he's floating. A sense of surrender, perhaps. Uh, a friend of mine thought that the hands were lifted in prayer. This is uh, six feet by nine feet. Uh, the horse is life size. And in person, um, people have said it feels very, very peaceful and a kind of a sense of infinity. 
For me, it's also six by nine life size horse. Um, this one is the struggle. The struggle struggles we have that we keep going, we keep swimming. This one I included, it, it was never quite finished, but I wanted, it was part of the series. And I, I it, to me, it's like swimming at night. It's, it's the sense of going into the unknown, not knowing where you're going, and it's okay. And you don't have to plan, you don't have to think, you can trust. This is called O Magnum Mysterium. I rarely title my works because I don't like it to limit, I don't like the title to limit the, um, the, the, uh, the viewer's uh, perspective. Um, I think this is the one and only mystical representation of God as a woman that I've ever done. I did the painting and I hung it on the wall and I woke up in the morning, the next morning, and I, I just started singing, Oh, Magnum Mysterium. So I thought, I've got to name it, Oh, Magnum Mysterium. Um, one of the things I like to create, as I mentioned, is scale, the sense of grandeur. Um, for me, this shape here has, has is kind of a mountain shape or a, an animal of some sort. And so you have this, this presence. And these orange verticals, to me, are musical tones. They're like coming toward us in sound. Bong, bong, bong. Uh, to me, the purple, the dark is perhaps grief, perhaps sadness, dripping down <clears throat> the orange at the bottom. Some people have seen it as angels, but what it is actually is I took my hands and I stuck them in the paint and I just pressed them onto the paper. Um, for me, what this is about is, is sort of speaking of how that all feelings are temporary even though they may not feel that way. And that they're just sort of cloaks that we wear. They're, they're outfits that, that are on us. Uh, and that, that if this is like, let's say the breasts and coming down to the crotch area here, this is, for me, this is our essence, this light, this hope, this splendor, this joy, this is our true selves. Ah, oh, red. Okay, so this triangle, this V shape, uh, red, first of all, color is absolutely cultural. So red in another culture would mean something else, but I certainly use it as an, as an emotional vocabulary from our culture. Um, because this has uh, these drips, it could be considered blood or it could be considered tears of pain. Um, for me, this painting is about when a, a feeling overtakes us. It's so dominant, we don't even have experience of other feelings at that time. It just takes us over. And I find that this is like a pathway here a pathway going over to this door into the light. And, and my message from my point of view is that even though we may not even know of this pathway going to another feeling, it sits there waiting, it's there waiting. Ah, so this is about color. I love color and this painting, I, I, I feel color as, especially juxtaposition of certain colors as like a buzzing vibration, like a high frequency buzzing. And for me, that's what this does. And also it's just so yummy. Uh, the title of this, this one does have a title. It's called uh, Something Good is Coming. But 
to me, this is so yummy. I just want to lick it. It's just, it's so color amazing. Okay, so this, this one and the next one are very similar in a certain ways. Um, this kind of combines realism with abstract. Uh, you have the hand. Some people see this as a skull or as, as a head of a monk that's his head shaved, a sense of vertebrae, perhaps a red heart and maybe a blue heart, uh, and certainly reaching, longing. This is painted in a much more expressive way. You, you feel the energy of how the paint was put on. So it adds that level of expression. And it, so you have this, which is almost put on in a violent way. I, this, this line here was just thrown from, the, from a bottle of paint. And, and, and over here, where you might want to go is is all subtle and gently painted. So, it, so how it's painted is also about what it is. And I've I, my own interpretation of this painting is that it's obstacles. That when we feel there's obstacles, whether those obstacles are parts of ourselves or whether the obstacles are outside of us, the obstacles that we have to go through to get to the promised land, so to speak or that we have to wait, wait for them to fall away. Again, this has the sense of a delicious landscape over here that would be really fun to walk around in. And it's such a curious landscape, uh, but yet we have these, this dark, these dark bars keeping us from, from going there, threatening to keep us from going there. Um, this on this one, I, I'm reminded to, to say that um, I'm definitely in the the tradition of romanticism more than classicism. I rarely paint a painting that's balanced and peaceful and of beauty. I I hope that there's beauty in there, but it's 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 diagonals, it's turmoil, it's moments of peace, it's driving it's <laughs> uh and this one i really love this kind of triangle down here that's like kind of like this safe harbor uh this this abode that's that that's that's holding its own against all of this going on here and and this kind of beautiful area you can go into over here and this lovely light that waits for you Okay, so these paintings are more like what I'm doing now. I've been working four feet by three feet uh, for about 10 years now. And I've collected um, about 40 to 50 of them that I'm, I'm wanting to have it in the show, um, all next to each other, like, like all lined up and that are in a uh, progression that allows the viewer to experience different feelings in time. So it's, it's more like a musical piece in that they, they can move through it and, and have this experience in time. Um, many people have felt that these are about the fires that we all live through. For me, it's, it's a fire in the belly. It's, it's, it's our energy that we have inside us, our passion, our, our zest. Um, while I'm doing these, I also, I guess, to sort of have an outlet for the the representational part that I love this, this I do drawings, I do ink drawings. Um, this is of a, of a sort of muffled woman. Uh, I won't go into the symbolism much in this. This is, this, here is pushing, you know, that, that sense of a force against all of these shapes being pushed around. And for me, this is like a spring that's, that's contracted, that at any minute, if it was let free, so it has this potential energy held that it could pop out. 
Now I'm going to show you, I'm, I'm sort of going over the amount of time I, I'm supposed to speak. So I'm going to sort of just show you these works without interpreting them. These are part of the series that, that I would have in, in a show altogether. Uh, so I'll just let you take a look. Thank you again. And if you want to see more, um, that's my website. And please um, email me. I'd love to have contact. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you so much for your. Thank you so much, Pamela. This was so amazing. Um, so um, uh, let's open it up to questions. <clears throat> Anybody uh, want to make any comments? And Karen, you're on. Pamela, I'm almost speechless. I cannot believe how wonderful your work is. I mean, I was like, oh, the abstractions are amazing. And then I love the figurative work and all of it. It just is just overwhelming. I noticed that um, you didn't, I couldn't see a signature on your work. So I wanted to ask you about that. And then also I noticed um, even on your labels, you didn't have dates. And as we know, that is very important, especially in concerning your legacy um, and the chronology of, of what you've created. So I wondered if you could just comment on those two things. The rest of it is just, uh, as an art historian, you know, wow, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Thank you, that's very touching. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I sort of go along with the abstract expressionists of signing in the back. Um, I, I always felt, you know, to, to put my name on it, I don't know, it felt sort of egotistical. Plus, it kind of wrecks the composition. You have to really figure out where to put it, you know, so that it doesn't, it becomes part of the painting. So it has to be part of the painting. Anyway, I've always signed it on the back. Um, uh, what was your other question? Oh, yeah, dates. About the dates, yeah. It's, um, yeah, I, I, I sort of avoid putting dates um, because, I, again, I don't feel the work is linear. You know, I'll do a, a piece that I did in Vermont in 1978, you know, is, is so close to what I'm doing now that, that I, and yes, for, for the, you know, record keeping, I, I keep very, very tight records. I just don't... Uh, if I can get away with not putting dates on my work, I do. I don't put them on. Okay, but you have them in your archive. That's oh, yeah. what I mean, because, you know, that it has to do with value, obviously. But uh -huh. um, I, I, I just, uh, you know, I was like, I was looking at them and I was like, oh, I love your portraits. They're so wonderful. And then, then I was like, oh, I love the the landscape and then the ones with the horse I just like I don't know which thing I preferred <laughs> but it's a beautiful body of work and obviously you're an incredibly skilled painter and we're honored to to be able to listen to you talk about it so thanks thank you okay tell us tell us yeah I, I absolutely want to um echo what Karen has said, the work is fabulous. And I really loved hearing you talk about it, you know, um, the emotions that it brought up, uh, your symbolism and what, what, what the different things meant to you. Um, my question is, you know, you have a lot of different things that you've done, different styles, different uh, ways of painting, um, uh, subject matter and so forth. Is there anything that you would um, at this point revisit? Because uh, the things that you do now really speak to me. I just, I love the abstracts and the colors because I'm, you know, all about that, that the colors. Mm -hmm. um, but is there anything that you would revisit at this point in your career? Well, I'm flirting with the idea of, of putting some 
realism back into the abstract pieces. Uh, it's, it, especially, you know, when I started getting ready, you know, in my mind uh, for this big show, uh, it uh, it sort of felt like an end of something, you know, kind of like I've got it. I've got 50 pieces that I want to show together. You know, I don't know. I, I'm in, in a sort of a, a limbo period where I'm thinking of uh, adding some of what's in the drawings into the painting. Oh, OK. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. See, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Pamela. Um, did you say that that you want to put the, the series in a show, or that they are in a show? They're at this point. They're only in a show in my mind. Okay, okay. I, wa I wasn't <laughs> sure because I thought I saw your name somewhere affiliated with a show that's up now. Maybe I'm wrong. Are you in a show somewhere now? I have a piece in the show in the Faulkner Gallery at, in um, Santa Barbara. Uh, I have a piece at the um, Ruth Ellen Hoegs Gallery, uh, the Gray Space, um, and probably others that I'm forgetting. Yeah. yeah, Nancy, you've seen her name many times. Yeah, I thought I had seen it <laughs> someplace in LA, but I, did, I just didn't remember. But um, yes, ditto what everybody else said. I think these are just incredible and I'm totally blown away by those portraits. Mm -hmm. They are just magnificent. Thank you. Totally wonderful. I, like, I mean, all of your work is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Those really spoke to me, probably because I'm so unable <laughs> to, to do that, but um, I just love them. Sandra? Thank you. Sandra, you gotta unmute. Thank you, Nancy. Sandra? Unmute. Unmute, there you go. <laughs> Cursor sound. So Pamela, several times when you were telling your early story of you know working with different Oldenburg and people, um, it seemed that you were, multiple, multiple folks wanted you to restrain from abstraction. And did you feel that at that time, or even looking back, that there was any, um, given the power of your abstraction that we saw tonight, that there was something of wanting to keep you in a more finite ter territory or um, was it all really experienced as a, a very, uh, we want to cross pollinate, develop you fully, all that. But there is an aspect of often, you know, male mentors in their own, sometimes not conscious way. They're not, I don't think they're trying to be restrictive, but they have an idea of how the females should present themselves. And I just wondered if your fullness at their age and stage of your life now in this work mm -hmm. um, of really claiming your place as an abstract master, I would say, um, if you look back to your, to your younger stage, if there's any twist of what I'm suggesting. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. I wouldn't say, uh, if, if I went to realism, I, I, I presented it that it was the teacher suggesting that I learn. Uh, I was grateful that I learned. I think that my swings toward realism had more to do with, you know, this is going to sound uh, sort of sad, uh, you know, my parents got it, you know, my, my, my uh, more people understood the realist, more people could relate to the realist, you know, and how much do you want to be so isolated and having such a small group of people that get your work. So occasionally I'd go back and I, I, that was just part of it, but it, 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 it just has a bigger audience and there's more recognition when you're doing realism. Yeah. Um, no, I think with the, with the male, you know, if I had any male teacher stories, it was that they didn't, they didn't pay attention to me. They, they gave most of the attention to the, the male, the male students and um, and would just uh, if they they just didn't consider me as important, which I I would get mad at, um, or felt rejected by. Um, hmm. But okay. that was that was uh, the only thing I'd say that, there's, that affected. There's another one of our members um, who often uh, most people think of her work strictly in environmental terms, but for her it's actually that dialogue 
that tension between abstraction and realism. And that's Danielle Eubank. And if you read her artist statements and how she describes her work from more of an art, an art standpoint versus in addition to her ex, you know, extraordinary commitment to the environment, it is that, that interplay. So I find it really interesting to hear you um, make similar suggestions. Thank you. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I, have, I have one more question that I hope will help others. And that is, um, obviously you're very prolific and you've been in a lot of shows and had a lot of success. Um, do you do all that management yourself? Do you apply to all these shows or do you have somebody help you? Do you have a gallery or do you have a man, you know, somebody that does the business side of things for you? Because that that's very time consuming and brain draining for sure. Yeah. Well, when I when I lived in New York City, you know, I went to a couple workshops and and they, they said, you know, you, you should use 50 percent of your time for art business and 50 percent of your time for making art. Well, I don't know about you, but I think all of us would like to use 100 percent just making it, you know, have somebody else do the work. Uh, but I know I, I've, I've done my own work always. Uh, I have hired assistants. Sometimes I get a, a student or an assistant that works for me for a short time. Um, I mean, because they leave, not because I want them to leave, but, uh, you know, to help me hang shows. And sometimes I, I they can help me with uh, applications, but so much of it, you have to make decisions yourself, what to send. Um, so you end up, you know, managing them, which is time consuming as well. Um, basically, I just try to balance. I try to to do the business and then change my mindset because it's such a different part of your brain and your your focus. So I usually like have two or three days that are for business, and then I have like a, a transition time, and then I go into the broader, bigger, abstract, intuitive side and and do painting for three days or four days. Um, so that's that's how I manage it by by kind of dividing it and um, and sometimes I rebel and just do a whole week of painting. <laughs> <laughs> Marilyn? Yeah. Oh sorry. Yeah. Um, well I have to agree, agree with everybody on, on, on this and I'm sort of gobsmacked. I, I think they're they're really awesome. And when I, when I see the big abstracts, I see like um, a symphony. I see all the emotions and all the colors are like notes. And I see all this incredible multi layers of, of emotions depending upon the viewer, you know, bringing it into it. Um, I think they're just stunning. I, I'm curious, uh, you have some on paper and some on, on canvases, I imagine. But what, what mediums do you work in? Um, the works on paper, I, they're, they're arches, rough watercolor paper, 22 by 30. I would tape them and gesso them. Uh, I did those for years, maybe, I don't know how many years, uh, 15, 20 years. Uh, but now, and, and that was oils. But now I do um, only acrylics, partially because I worry about, you know, the carcinogenic aspect. But I've moved into to acrylics now, so they're they're acrylics on canvas, and they're pretty much all three feet by four feet. Yeah, it's a good scale, uh, I, and the, and the um, the ones with the horses, they, they were so they, a lot of poetry, a, a little bit of a, a fantasy surrealism, mental, you know, um, like, like emotion manifested in an object kind of thing. Mm. Really, really intriguing stuff. I'm really, really stunned. Be beautiful work, Be really beautiful. Thank, Thank you, Marilyn. Monica? Yeah. Hi, I'm gonna sound like a, a broken record to everyone else. <laughs> Just amazed and, 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 and it was the same kind of thing as others have said, you know, one genre of work and then like, oh, that's beautiful. And then there's another kind of like, oh, wow, look at that. So it was the breadth of, of everything you do was just amazing to look at. And then when you got to the drawings, for some reason, seeing everything um, condensed down to, some, to black and white, to the black line, um, I really connected to the drawings. And I'm wondering, do you do, have you been 
consistently doing drawings? Do you do drawings as studies? Do you do something with the drawings? Or, um, I want to hear about the drawings. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad, thanks. Um, well, I, I did some drawings in Paris, which I didn't show you, which were more ink drawings. Um, that I found I could just, you know, I just thought, well, let's just try this. And I, I could just draw figures. I could just draw. I mean, without uh, without a reference, it, it kind of surprised me. Um, the drawings that I showed you are not are not studies. They're their own pieces. But the thing that, that I find kind of wacky is that I do them when I'm watching movies. I'm lying down on a couch and I do them when I watch movies and I consider them like doodles. Uh, but everybody likes them, so I consider them art, you know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I, mean, I have shown some framed. I have shown some framed, uh, but uh, I, I mainly show them to the critique groups. I'm in more than, than publicly, partially because they're a lot of work to, I, I, I think framing is a lot of work. So, you know, you do your business, you do your painting and you frame, you know. <laughs> so. Who photographs your work? I do. Do you use some kind of a setup or do you just, do you use your iPhone or? I, I used to use a setup. I used to uh, do them once a year outside on in the shade with, uh, you know, film, you know, slides. Uh, but now I use uh, my, my I, I have an Android that, that I bought specifically to take photos of the work. I, I hardly even use the phone. Um, and it, uh, you know, they're not always perfect. They're not like when I used to do setups. I also used to use tungsten lights at 45 degree angles, do that whole setup. But now I'm kind of looser. Yeah. They're not as good, but you know, if I need a good one, I, I know people I can take it to if I want like a one for publication or something. I always find that it's so much easier to photograph work that's all in color than work that is on paper with a lot of white, a, a lot of the paper left, because then you get these shadows and everything if you're trying to do it yourself, which I do. I do all of my by myself, and then I get very frustrated because yeah. the light isn't even. Yeah, that's true. So um, I, I just want to um, talk about Pamela. You're, you know, when I think about what you presented to us at the beginning and all those amazing studies you did of realism, studying in the um, museums, copying those and, and the colors you, you were able to mix, you know, you're definitely a colorist. And I think, I feel like those were like just part of you as studies. And then once, like you said, when you walk down Second Avenue, all of a sudden you, you took that and you went that from those studies to coming more internal and being much more um, intuitive about your work and being expressive because all that information that you had learned is in there, but you turned this corner on Second Avenue and just went, you know, kind of like screw it and just threw all that out and went to something that was much, these are much more personal, you know, mm -hmm. uh, study realism. When I, I used to like do a lot of realism too. I did study at the Art Students League in realism. You learn about how things work together, the mechanics of drawing and painting and all that. But like they, they're always saying, what's your voice, finding your voice. And I feel that these later works are your voice, who you are, and they're stunning. I mean, first of all, the scale, I can only imagine walking into a room with those huge um, pieces because the scale would just en envelop you um, compared to something that's, you know, maybe small and re relatively handable. Um, but I do see that the scales are very important and that the color, it's intuitive, and evocative of something that's more personal. Am I, you know, speaking truth or not? <laughs> what do you think? Yes, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. In fact, yeah, I've, I've always felt like it's sort of like a, 
just echoing what you said, basically I've been training my intuition and, and now I work, you know, in the flow and I, and I don't think much. I, I don't think, you know, at all about the past to the, you know, yesterday or tomorrow. And I'm just involved with working and I make decisions that, that uh, I, I don't even know why I make them. You know, there's no uh, very little, uh, words going on very consciousness very little consciousness other than you know just doing and and doing until it's done and i i absolutely love that state it's it's my favorite state in the world <laughs> mm-hmm. true um and so stacy if you want to unmute yourself i just wanted to say even though you've got such a, a variety of abstract figures, that sort of thing. And the colors, of course, are transcendent, actually. I I can see like a hand, I can almost see your hand through even abstract to to figure to back to abstract to figure. It's really, it was really wonderful because I could could almost taste your artist's hand and it it was very present for me. Thank you. So thank you. (laughs) 